At the time of the American Revolution, the Royal Navy is mistress of the seas. Britannia's trident, as they say, is sharp and pointed. Probably somewhere between 800 and 1,000 ships in the Royal Navy. Britannia does rule the waves. And then, of course, there's the Continental Navy. It was a bit presumptuous of the Continental Congress to decide to build a navy. But on the other hand, there was a grand seafaring tradition in the American colonies. We were a seafaring community. And so it was logical that we would turn to the sea to defend our liberties and to pester the British. The Congress approves the construction originally of 13 frigates. Now there's a magic number, 13 frigates. Some of them will get built and get to sea. Some of them will never get to sea. Some will be captured. It's not an altogether glorious story. But on the other hand, there are some notable victories by the Continental Navy. Certainly, John Paul Jones is one. And there are other brave captains, Captain Abraham Whipple, for example, commander of the ship Providence, the frigate Providence, uh, raids the British Jamaica fleet. Uh, Captain Nicholas Biddle turns in a very creditable performance. It's also true, in a kind of curious way, that one of the great naval not victories, but naval engagements of the American Revolution is fought up on Lake Champlain. It's an American fleet against a British fleet. And who commands the American fleet on Lake Champlain? Benedict Arnold. Uh, and it's a battle that's fought early in the war. Uh, Benedict Arnold loses to the British fleet, uh, but he manages to delay the British advance down through Lake Champlain uh, one year in time for the Americans to prepare to defend themselves in 1777, a year later. So there are numerous examples of individual bravery and courage. But the Continental Navy, in as much as one thinks of a Navy, is never a serious threat to the Royal Navy. It does pester them, and it does serve a couple of uh, important services to the American cause. One is that it serves as a sort of messenger service between the American colonies and France and the West Indies to some degree. Uh, so money, for example, that need, French gold that needs to be brought in is brought in by Continental Navy ships. Diplomats that have to be transported. John Adams, for example, uh, goes to uh, France. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, of course, and other American diplomats are transported in American vessels, the Continental Navy vessels. So they do serve a purpose, but there's certainly no challenge to Britannia. And by the end of the American Revolution, there's only one Continental Navy vessel left. She's the Alliance, is her name. And she, right after the war is over, is sold out of service again. And the United States will not have another Navy, will not have a Navy, uh, until the presidency of George Washington in the Federal Republic uh, and the formation of the United States Navy. It is interesting and important to note that uh, several officers who end up to be very important in the new Federal Navy under George Washington, saw their first service in the Continental Navy. So there is a tradition, there is a heritage there uh, of naval activity. That is not to say, however, even though the Continental Navy was not necessarily a key player uh, in the Revolution, navies were a key player in the American Revolution. And in point of fact, the, Ameri the victory of the Americans in the American Revolution is in great measure due to naval victories, but not naval victories by the Continental Navy.